welcome you all back to another episode of Human Humane Architecture. We're broadcasting live from around Munich, Germany, and Honolulu, Hawaii. And we're reflecting on the pre- and the post-pandemic situation of our paradise in Hawaii. And we're doing this with uh, Bishop Museum historian, our uh, favorite co-host, DeSoto Brown. Hi, DeSoto. Good morning, Martin, from Honolulu to Germany. Let's jump right to the first slide, and let's please recap a little bit where we have left uh, last week, if you don't mind. Yes. You you want to do that, or I want to do that? <laughs> and if we're, if we're getting cut out a little bit, we have to apologize in advance. We're doing video by Zoom, and we're doing audio by Skype, so it's a little more improvised than already. But, but we left with uh, promoting another, hopefully, again, post-pandemic production traveling together to uh, add to the series of study abroad that we want to do that I want to have you with me and look at the special typology of federal buildings for the Allied forces, the German Bundeswehr. And these are two projects our firm has been doing, and we've been looking at that. And then uh, we want to go to the next slide. And um, what do we have to say about that? Is, uh, though, we're at Paulus Bookstore in Portland now. Yeah, Paulus Bookstore is one of, if not the biggest bookstores in the United States. And unfortunately, it is financially in trouble, as many bookstores are during the pandemic in particular. But when you visited the uh, Paulus Bookstore in Portland, you found a copy of this book, the Red Book, which is called The Architecture of Democracy. And inside the book is a picture of one of the buildings that we discussed last week, the mess hall or the dining hall for the German army. And uh, this was this was uh, one of the two that your firm did. And there it is inside the book. Yeah, you, you brought in, in our discussion uh, in preparation, you pointed out an interesting dilemma that the United States being comprised of people running away from Europe for several reasons, but one of them being that they didn't want to be part of authoritarian cultures and, and countries anymore with, uh, you know, royals and kings and, and other rulers. They wanted to be free, and that's deeply ingrained in the Constitution of the United States, we the people. However, then to protect that later on, uh, they did the opposite because the military is set in a hierarchical way, right? So within... Your, your major sort of goals uh, you, to protect these, you have a conflict of interest, to say the least, right? Exactly, because the whole purpose of the United States was to deny that people were authorized to lead other people simply by the fact of their birth. In other words, we did not acknowledge the existence of royalty as automatic rulers, and so the whole United States was based on the idea of overcoming a caste system and working your way up from nothing to become powerful and rich. Whereas, in order to protect this system, as you just said, you create a military, which is 100% a hierarchy in which people are better than others and look down upon others and order others around. So it is an ironic contrast. And we said that architects, uh, in, in our thinking anyways, have an obligation above and beyond what the client might think they want and here, especially because this is as public, as civic as it can get, because it's federally operated and run and, and financed. So it's everyone's taxes that are put into these buildings, right? Exactly. So, so we took that very position to sort of undermine that hierarchical system, not only typologically, as we were talking about, as far as where the different ranks would dine, but also sort of, uh, forcing uh, the, uh, the the client to be a pioneer in in, in passive design and passive solar design, so making a building that's truly a post fossil, a representative of the just begun post fossil era. This was actually built in the year of the turn of the millennium in 2000. And um, talking politics, let's move on to the next slide, and you share what you remember when we talked about that particular lady here. Well, this lady, in, initially, when, the, uh, when your building was built, 
you won an award for that building from the state where she was the Minister of Culture or something like that. And in the picture in the lower right corner, there's your father, you, and this woman receiving the award that you got for the building, and it's just also acknowledged in the book, which is seen there. She has gone on to become the head of the um, the head of the European Union, correct? Yeah, the president. Mm -hmm. And so she has acknowledged in the award that you got initially that the building you did, which, as you just said, tried to break up some of the hierarchy and offer the common people, in other words, the privates, the people at the lowest part of the hierarchy of the military, an equality and an experience just in that one building that acknowledged that they were just as good as the officers. Yeah. And a little correction, the building she was awarding us was actually a community grocery store. We were oh, sorry, 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 that's terrible. correct. No, you're, you're totally right. But then she actually moved in into this sort of interim position, not position, but stage in her life and her career, where she actually became, which the uh, middle picture on the right side shows very clearly, and in the picture I was shooting at an inaugurational event for Marines at the, at the top left, which are uh, picky basement um, experts, um, uh, Stefan and, and Kirsten's niece, had, had signed up for the Marines, so we were there at their inaugural event, and I was able to witness her there again, and this time functioning as the uh, Secretary of Defense for Germany. And uh, by the way, uh, besides all that, and what she was originally, was what, what you indicated, she was the Minister for Cultural Affairs and Family Affairs. She's very qualified in that as well, because she is the mother of seven children. Whoa! Pretty impressive. Right? <laughs> and we recognize some recommendations from our culture to your culture. Might be We might want to have a, uh, the female factor in uh, ruling the military as well, which she has done very uh, successfully. And we looked it up. We never had a female secretary of defense. So this is probably time to get that. I would agree. And we also discussed Angela Merkel as the leader of Germany in this time of pandemic uh, problems and how her ratings had gone from very poor to very high in Germany. You said she's up to 80 percent approval because of how she's been handling the pandemic versus how people had been looking at her before with other problems. That's correct. And being majorly the, the welcoming culture of uh, letting in a million people who are not from here. Right. Uh, talking to female, uh, you know, force and factor of, of women in the military, let's go to the next slide. This, we always encourage the audience to uh, think about examples from their immediate family or, or, or other social context. And this is one that you threw in about uh, a very beautiful lady at the very top in the middle. And well. that one looks very familiar to us. <laughs> well, it looks very familiar to me because the woman standing in the center of this photograph, which was taken in 1942, is my mother is a very young lady, and she is part of the Red Cross Auxiliary here in Honolulu after the start of World War II. And when World War II started and throughout the war, one of the major things that happened in the United States as well as other countries was that women got moved into other roles that they had not had before because many of the men were in the military. So women were really the backbone in some situations of running things, certainly workers in munitions factories and other situations, because of the unavailability of men. And that is something that um, it's also some it's also an indication of in times of disaster or stress or major changes like what we're going through right now economically and socially with the pandemic, that we shake up the roles and we look at things differently and sometimes we will, that will lead to some long-lasting effects that we don't originally, uh, at the time, we don't anticipate are going to be the situation. So the period of World War II and the period we're going through now may be comparable in a lot of the changes that are going to come about that we don't see right away. Martin, are you there? Your mother is a very important eyewitness. I'm still there. there. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I hear you. I'm back. Yes. Yeah. So uh, in a couple of weeks, we can say um, your 
mother is having a very important birthday, which uh, she's going to be, you know, one century young. Right? <laughs> yes, she is. And, and so she is, and, as you said, she's an eyewitness to this time period, and she's fully yeah. mentally there, and she's telling me these stories. I was telling her, she was telling me stories yeah. last night when well, I showed her this picture. Yeah, and and talking about, you know, coming up birthdays, I want to extend uh, retrospectively just a day late uh, uh, birthday greetings to my mother, who is just turned three quarters of a century young, so... You know, happy birthday, Mom, again. Yes. So let's look closer into the subject matter, how the island has been, you know, dramatically informed by previous sort of uh, catastrophic events of having to do with the military and, and wartime. So let's go to the next picture. And, and these are all uh, treasures from your treasure box. But before we do that, before we go to this riding, uh, let's do your weekly dose of German reading and recall what the text at the very top is about. Well, when we talked about the two mess halls or the dining halls that you and your father built for the military, you discussed how difficult it was to get your changes into the building the way you wanted them. And the military, of course, being very controlled by rules and regulations, was resistant to this. And so you ended up with a very bad relationship and a rejection and nobody talking to each other after the second building. But years later, you got a, a letter from one of the officers who wrote you, and that's the text in German at the top of this picture, saying, now that the building has been in use, we have to apologize. We are very happy with it. It worked out very well. Thank you for the work that you did. So you were vindicated. Yeah, and what we can pass on to the emerging generation as an encouragement is versus we as the, say, the Community Design Center and the School of Architecture is waiting for the Department of Defense coming and asking them or us, uh, me being part of the school, uh, to uh, basically do something that they want. We, we might want to consider to go the other way, that we look closely at them, and especially in times, dramatically changing times, on all levels and also for the military and us being well educated advising them what to do and obviously what we had done in, right. in that past. Right. And so because buildings might not be as sort of, you know, in inclusive anymore military buildings and they used to be, they might open up more in, in many ways on many levels and which we would hope become more sort of inclusive and, and how, you know, uh, a, a culture could be all of a sudden being exposed to things that are otherwise uh, hidden during um, uh, times of military escalation shows this treasure document from the archive and explain a little bit more the, the reason behind. Okay, well, so what, what this is introducing us to some of the pictures that we're going to look at right now of military in Hawaii, particularly on the island of Oahu. And in this picture, it's a really interesting, I think, fascinating thing from the 1920s because it's a regulation sign saying dangerous driving by civilians is not allowed on this military reservation, which is probably a picture taken here on Oahu. But because of the multicultural and ethnically diverse culture in which we live here, this warning is also written in the Hawaiian language on the left and the Japanese language on the right in which these regulations are being enforced. And now we're going to look at some of the many, uh, great deal of evidence there is of how this military construction has affected us here. Yeah, and look, we're all on the island of Oahu, our next picture here. Yeah. Um, because this is this is Hickam Air Force Base, right? right. Yes, it is. And that's and that is very close to as uh, to the Honolulu International Airport, and so you. You told me that whenever students come through where Air Force One is going to go, you know, down and going to take off from there again. Yes. And, and here from your archive, again, very interesting snapshots from different situations when it was um, sort of built and then when it was under construction and then was sort of deconstructed through, um, again, attack. Yes, exactly. So Hickam Air Force Base is one of the many huge military installations on Oahu, and when it was constructed, you can see pictures of it in 1937 being constructed, it was a huge airfield. I mean, even by international standards, this was a big group of airplanes and a big group of hangars here on the island of Oahu, and hard to believe in the middle of the ocean. 
And because it was such an important military installation, on December 7th, 1941, the Japanese attacked it and caused a great deal of damage to it. And you can see that in the picture on the lower right. But in the picture on the upper left, we see how big. I mean, this picture is taken in 1959, and look how big it is. And it's still there today as a major installation. Absolutely. And the next slide is, is just one of many pictures of, uh, we go to the next slide, of Pearl Harbor and the attack. Um, and then, but then at the top right, so we could need to go back one picture, please. Um, yeah, there we go. But at the top right, um, not wanting to over sort of romanticize the tragic events, but there's sometimes something good about everything bad is actually how after the war, the uh, Austrian immigrant um, architect Alfred Price has built the uh, famous Arizona Memorial, that floating uh, sort of memorial uh, space place over the USS Arizona. And, and you, you, you were adding an interesting aspect of, of his personal life and how it was intertwined very tragically to war events, right, DeSoto? Yes, it's an amazing situation because this iconic structure, which is so symbolic of World War II, was done by this man who was ethnic or national, his uh, national identity was Austrian, and he, in fact, was put in a temporary internment camp here on Oahu during the war because he was considered to be an enemy alien. He had an Austrian passport. So he, along with many ethnic Japanese and Japanese citizens, was put in, a, in an internment camp. He was imprisoned, and he gets out of it, and later we also discovered he was looked down upon as potentially being a communist after the war, which is considered a terrible thing. And then he, he does this incredibly patriotic thing, which is so considered so American by designing the Arizona Memorial. Absolutely. And we're going to see him again uh, very soon. Yes, but, we will. Uh, let's go to the next slide, uh, which is uh, showing us another big location of the military that's more... Uh, slightly inland, and that's Schofield Barracks. Yes. And when I was showing this to my bonus son, Sammy, here, um, and in the previous picture, actually, the visiting the, head, uh, the Arizona Memorial was with my son, Lenny. But here, Sammy basically said, hey, this all looks very much lined up, very in order. And we argued, you know, that's the nature of the military, that they're lining up in a row and they're marching in a row and everything is pretty regulated. But you also add that there is also a diversity within, the, within that uniformity, right? Absolutely. And what we're going to see is when we're talking about architecture for the military, which is the point of what we're discussing here, it is not necessarily all exactly the same building repeated over and over again because the military builds all different kinds of buildings for different uses. Some of them are just to house machinery. Other buildings vary because of who in the military is supposed to use them. So, for example, officers' quarters and officers' entertainment buildings are far more plush and comfortable than the ones with the common enlisted men who are down at the bottom of the hierarchy. So it's a very, it's a really varied group of things that don't all fit together just because the military built them. Yeah. And we were, let's zoom in and look at some of the buildings uh, from the building stock for the next slide. Uh, that that you provided here, and they, you know, started to remind us of again some European um, sort of heritage, and we we threw in two of Le Corbusier's uh, buildings there on the right is the Villa Stein, and to the left is the Weissenhof settlement here in Germany, and 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 as you were analyzing them, you said in their in their making, they're not they're not standard, and they're using new elements, they're using prefabrication, they're using automation, so they're very much like Le Corbusier was saying. Uh, yeah, the house is a machine like to live in, yes. As far as, exactly, exactly. And to the top right there is this Alfred Price again. This is actually the first project he ever built for himself. And we featured this in a show where this is a, a quotation from with Jack Wilmer, who's currently living, owning the house and living in there. And that one looks like it, it fell from the sky and, and came straight from, <laughs> from Austria, right? Right, it certainly does. And these little white boxes that you see in the big picture are uh, homes for junior officers with families at Schofield Barracks who were built in about 1932. 
And yes, they are quite different from everything else in the background or anywhere else you were going to see on the base there because they were being modern and they were being efficient and they were using the trends that were popular then. Mm -hmm. And let's go to the next slide of, of other buildings on, on Schofield Bell or experience, which were which we like more because the previous ones, although that's questionable, what we still call them sort of invasive because they were very literally coming from another culture and climate. These ones here we like because they look very exotic because they're recognizing the specific climate we're having uh, being out in the sun. So there are arcades here. There's a lot of nice there. And they don't even look very institutional. They look more domestic, right? Correct. And so what we see in the biggest picture are the uh, enlisted men's barracks at Schofield Barracks from the early 1900s, and they are. They have arcades. They have large open areas. They're very easy breezy. This is all before air conditioning, and so they take advantage of and embrace the climate. And there also are, for example, in the lower left corner, there's the uh, library at Schofield Barracks, which looks domestic. It looks like a home. It looks like a tropical home. And on the right, we do see officers' homes, which are filled with uh, shrubbery, and they look very pleasant, and it looks very domestic. It looks like an upper-class suburb someplace. Mm -hmm. Let's go to the next slide here, uh, because we want to check out some... some. For, well, before we do that, that's, that's again, Schofield Barracks, and um, if you look at the picture at the bottom left, it's sort of recognizing the exotic, the tropical exotic, because when you sort of stereotypically think of soldiers having to be confined in, in boxes as, you know, our client was requiring and we were rebelling against that in a democratizing kind of pacifist way. Here you see people in a picture from the early 90s sitting outdoors, hanging out in the breeze, being shaded, so very tropical, exotic, right? Right, right, and with palm trees next to them as well. But you also pointed out in the picture in the upper left how these wooden stairs, which look kind of like bleachers, which you added to the second dining hall that you built for the military in Germany, those steps actually can serve like a bleachers, and people can sit outdoors on this wooden, these wooden surfaces during good weather and enjoy their, enjoy their meals if they want to. And again, democratizing and making things more comfortable for people. Yeah. Let's move to the next slide. Uh, we've been so far predominantly being on the south and the west side of the military. And to add to that, at the very top left is um, Brett Segekava, who used to host our pi and mobile and my put on mobile before you kind of do it this year. And he's basically at Barbara's Point. And Barbara's Point, he basically, with his uh, um, um, helicopter a cruise business, they got kicked out because the military is sort of reclaiming that. And so we're talking probably the Magnus Studios get kicked out, but they can move into the former Hawaii Five O, which is in your front yard at Diamond Head. That's right. They're right. continuing the reboot. We're talking about reboot of both shows. That might be something that is happening. We also see um, uh, one of the most uh, iconic buildings of that typology of military architecture by the gentleman in the slightly to the left of the middle, who is Albert Kahn, who is considered to be one of the prime architects who has done a dedicated, a, a humongous uh, body of work, that typology. And, and at the bottom there, we're actually at Kaneo uh, uh, Bay, right? Yeah. And, and one of the things that's important to note is that some of these military bases have in fact been given back to the state of Hawaii from the military use. So we've lost some Dillingham Airfield and Fort, uh, Fort Ruger by Diamond Head, etc. Some of this land has in fact been not used by the military. And going back to Barker's point, that picture there with that, that rounded, very modern looking building, um, again for a personal connection, my grandfather, my mother's father, was one of the commanding officers at Barber's Point, again, during World War II, which we talked about earlier. So that, again, has a personal connection to me. Yeah, very interesting. And being now sort of on the on the north, north shore, east shore, north shore, let's go to the next slide here, because this is another location, um, uh, Bellows Bay, 
and it's close to Waimanalo, one of the most beautiful uh, beaches on the island. And uh, up there is, uh, is again, how our PIing mobile was cruising by there and was pushed away because they, have, they had to do some training. And you pointed out at the first embodiment of uh, that military was actually of nomadic nature with tents. And so um, I, I threw in at the very top left uh, uh, a project by when our emerging uh, talent, Graham Hart, who is now teaching at our school, was designing in that area. He sort of, uh, you know, subconsciously or intentionally uh, kind of referred to that in his design. But at the top right, we see another contemporary sort of reinterpretation of that type. And what is that? Well, unfortunately, when military was here with tents, uh, we see this being mimicked, if you might say so, by the homeless or the urban nomads, or in this case, as you said, suburban nomads, which also you see at Waimanalo. So we see the historic tents of the United States Army, and we see the current day tents and makeshift structures of homeless people in the same location. Absolutely. And that gets us to the last slide here. Uh, because we're saying you know, all things considered, uh, maybe not literally, but figuratively, the mindset of the military, and being very on the spot, very little romantic, um, or, you know, or melancholic, they're very on the spot and very efficient, and they could also be effective. So we're saying maybe, again, providing what we call the CCCs, which we developed with the, the cargo court, you could basically be a contribution to, again, to humanity being based on the principles on, of the military and even being delivered by the military, right? Exactly. And one of the things the military's got to do is be able to transport things, put them in place, and set them up very quickly. And that's something that we hope could potentially be done with the housing that can be developed from uh, shipping containers. It's something we've talked about before, and it's something that is potentially even more relevant as we deal with the economic fallout of the pandemic, making huge changes economically and potentially putting people out of their homes. So if we're going to need housing, this is something that we need to look into. Yeah, and but on, uh, going with that, pairing that uh, on a positive note, if uh, what the current situation is doing, helping the climate by us using lesser fossil fuels, Fuel. Fossil fuel is what the United States has majorly been fighting over and about. So if we cut this back, uh, we might free up some funding that we could relocate to the things that might be more necessary than fighting each other in the world, right? I think that that is a wonderful, optimistic note to end on. Okay. All right. <laughs> So uh, with that, we're at the end of the show. Uh, we're going to do uh, one last uh, part of this one here. Direct us to the economical force who is as powerful as the military, and, and that's going to be tourism. So we're going to return to that, but also how militarism and tourism are intertwined and their past and future potential. And we have our exotic escapism expert, Susanna, join us for that, that we're looking forward to. That's right, next, next week. All right, so until then, stay safe and sound, and 